praises to our God. Every word of worship.
still power in the name of Jesus. Still power in his name. Amen. I tell you, I'm thankful for that because he's just as close as the mention of his name. And uh, I want my ushers to come at this time. I, I get a couple of guys to help me out. Tonight's offering will go to the support of your youth. And we want you to give as given unto the Lord. And God will bless you for doing just that. All right, bow your heads and your hearts again. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here and to give back to you, God. We thank you, Lord, for our, for our youth, God, for the youth ministry, Lord, for the children's church. And I ask you to continue, Lord, to bless the gift and giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just feel like something good is about to happen. Just feel like 
Lord. Amen. All right, we're going to let you be seated for a moment. We're going to go ahead and let our teens go uh, to class, and uh, I'm going to make some announcements, and then we're going to take some needs to the Lord, and then we're going to get into our class. And uh, But we... Uh, uh, I, let me say before I go any farther, we appreciate you so much being here on this Wednesday night service. I know some of you that your days start way early in the morning and uh, with your jobs and all that. And I know uh, sometimes it can be a, a struggle on Wednesday night, but may God bless you for being faithful to his house and coming and be here. I know that you're here because you're hungry for the word and you have a desire to, uh, to be in God's house. And I thank you so much for that and may God bless you. In way of announcements, let me say that September uh, the 17th Children's Church and Primary Class are having a connection night from 5 to 7 here at the church. So uh, parents, if your child, if they have some uh, somebody that they want to invite to, to come to be with them, it's just a great time for them to, to fellowship with other kids in the church. And uh, But that will be here at the church at 5 to 7 on September uh, the 17th. Also, October the 1st, it'll be here before we know it. The church is planning on having a rummage sale, and uh, we're asking for any type of donations and things that are good quality that will sell, and uh, so uh, we're going to do that. They're also going to do that at 8 o'clock that morning, and they have a bake sale, and also going to sell some barbecue sandwiches and, and barbecue nachos and things. If you would like any more details on that, uh, please see my mother in the back, and also, um, uh, let's see. Uh, this side, Sister Becky wants to know that everybody know that this Saturday, the 27th, the teens will be going to Six Flags, and uh, they're going to meet here at the church at 6:15, and they will leave at 6:30. The price for that is $50 a ticket, and if they want extra spending money, they might want to take it and uh, take it with them. So that will be uh, Saturday here on the, the this Saturday, the 27th, and also. She wants everybody to know on the 27th that uh, the primary class is going to be going to the aquatic center. And uh, in, in Pocahontas, they're going to be there from 1230 to 330. And so if the child, if they're 13 and under, the cost will be $3. And parents, if you want to go, anybody that's 14 and up, the, the price will be $5 a person. So uh, go and swim and have just a great time there. Don't overlook Sunday morning service. We want you to be here for Sunday morning for service. And uh, we uh, just expecting God to do some great things. Please be in prayer for Sunday morning service. And, uh, you know, if you call and maybe invite somebody to come, be praying for the service, you know, they might just show up. They might just show up for church Sunday morning. So uh, just keep, uh, keep that in your prayers and, and continue to, to invite somebody to come to be with you Sunday morning. We're going to take up some prayer requests at this time. And if you have a need, let's make it known, and we're going to pray uh, one for another before we get into the class. Yes, sir. Okay. Brother Greg's sister, Steph. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right. Oh, yes. 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 Remember that family. Sure. Anyone else? Blake. Okay. Miss Corey. Okay. Okay, Miss Stacy, Mom. Okay, Dad. Okay. All right, Brother Charles. Okay, Swimmer Chris and Matt. Okay, Sister. Yes, sir. Okay, Miss Cody. Anyone else on this side? Okay. All right. In the middle. I miss anybody here. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Pray 
praying for healing. Yes. Anyone else? I overlook anybody. Yes, ma'am. Okay. My goodness. Well, God's bigger than breast cancer. He's bigger than cancer, so we believe that. Yes. Brother David. Okay. All right. All right. Well, would you stand? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to remember our class and our church and also our country. And uh, and we're going to get started in our class. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, God, for each and every blessing that you've given us, God, your love, your grace, and your mercy. God, we're knowing that we know that we have confidence tonight that, Lord, that you're able to do anything and everything. God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is too big or too small for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would heal those that are sick, those that are afflicted, those that, God, they need a healing, that need a miracle, Lord. We, we know that you're still on the throne. And I ask you, God, to have mercy upon them, Lord, and touch those that are sick, those that are afflicted tonight. I pray, God, for each and every family need God, and it doesn't matter, Lord, if we can bring any need to you, if it's marital, if it's spiritual, it's if, if it's financial, we know that, God, that you're able to see each and every need, Lord, and meet our every needs according to your will. God, those that have lost, God, they're dealing with sorrow, God, the loss of a loved one, I pray that you would move upon their hearts, God, and comfort them as only you can do. God, we all have lost loved ones. We ask, God, that you would keep your hand upon them, Lord, and you would Prick at their heart, God, and knock upon the door of their heart and draw them to an altar of salvation. I pray, God, for our country, that, God, you would keep your hand up on America, Lord, that revival of repentance would continue to move across this land. I pray, God, for this church, and, Lord, I ask you to help us to be the light, Lord, that you desire us to be, to shine in this community. And, Lord, I pray for this class. God, as we endeavor to rightly divide your word of truth, let your anointing, God, be upon every heart, God, and let every word that is said Bring glory and honor to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you can be seated. If you want to jump back with me to uh, the book of, uh, let's see, let's go back to the book of Mark. uh, Because I I feel like I need to recap just a little bit. First of all, we've had a a great response in this class, and, and this is what I I felt led to do on these Wednesday nights is to deal with situations that we deal with that specifically afflict us. And so we're not going to have no set um, um, rotation, I guess. I I could say it like that. I've talked to the teachers. If we feel like we need to continue on with something such as this, we're going to continue on uh, if it's helping. And so... uh, I feel like that's the right direction. Uh, last Wednesday night, was it a help? Amen. Man, I was wondering there for a minute. <laughs> uh, if you said, uh, well, I uh, had some repenting to do, well, uh, we're going to make sure the altars are open tonight in case, just in case, somebody realizes there's another issue there. And so I, I want to recap just, just a very, very little bit, and then we will look at this text. But let me, let me remind you, first of all, while I'm teaching, if you have a question, we want you to ask a question. But I know when we're talking about a subject such as this, well, maybe the question that you want to ask or you want to, uh, you know, that you want to uh, know the answer to, it may not be something you want to ask in a in a setting, if it's something specific to your situation, all right, buddy, with me. But I, I still want you to contact later. Let's talk about it. Let's help. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor, and I'm a pastor at heart. So if I can help you, and pray with you, or point you to somebody in the church that I know that you can confide in, that can help you, that's been through some the the same something similar, no situation is identical, even if they are trying to be identical, 
The fact of the matter is your situation is yours and the other person is theirs. And so, but if I can point you to somebody that can help, look, we're here to help. And as a church, uh, we need to stand shoulder to shoulder and be here to pray for one another and to bear one another's burdens. And so uh, take advantage of that. So as we're talking about this, this situations as such as forgiveness, I know that, that they are not, uh, there's nothing, I'm not here to make light of or to belittle your situation any at all. And so a lot of times the issues that we're having problems with is stuff we don't even want to talk about. We'd rather not even talk about it. Because, and I mentioned it last week, we can get in that place where we have learned to live with it, and we just accepted life for how it is, and we just, amen, and we just try, and we just move on. We can stick it back there, and, but it's, it's, it's not, that's not the will of the Lord. And so when we look at Mark 11, I hope that even if you've learned to live with it, and even if you've learned to live with it without it bothering you to an extent, I hope that our desire is to be what God wants us to be. And so uh, that's, that's where we want to be at. Forgiveness, again, if you, if you made notes last week, if you're going to make uh, notes this week, then this is something you probably already have written down. But forgiveness or to forgive means to lay aside, to lay it aside. And uh, something we can't do without the help of the Lord. And so um, I want to remind us of the dangers, and then we're going to look at Mark 11 one more time. The dangers. As we look in Mark 11, is that us harboring unforgiveness is a breakdown of relationship. Now, we already know that it, if you have a problem with an issue and you had a relationship with him, that in the natural, that relationship is probably severed. That relationship is probably broke. But when we look at it in the scripture, what we learn is, is that it's a breakdown of relationship with the Lord. When we harbor unforgiveness, I think about what I'm saying. I know I'm building up a mountain pretty big, but I'm, I'm going to tell us how for that mountain to be moved in just a moment. But if we look at harboring and we have unforgiveness in our heart, what the scripture is teaching us here in Mark 11, because it's talking about praying, the Lord says, if you're going to stand and pray and you've got ought against your brother, but let me just put it in our terms, and I hope this is not too blunt, but let me just say it like this. Before you talk to me, first go to your brother and forgive them, and then come back and we'll talk. In other words, the Lord is expecting us, expecting us to go and to make sure there's no ought between any of us if we're going to talk to him, because most of the time when we're talking to God, we're asking him for something. And that's not how it's always supposed to be, but most of the time when we talk to the Lord, it's because we need something. And the Lord's saying, if you need something, then I need you to do something. Because the same grace that you're expecting me to extend to you is good for the person you've got an issue with. So that's what I want you to understand. I want to leave that there and not do too much recapping. But it's a breakdown of relationship because it breaks down our prayer uh, and our connection with the Lord. Now, Mark 11, this is what we looked at, verse 25 and verse number 26. And I'll ask you some questions. And when you stand, pray and forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. I ask you this question, and it's something we've already answered, but I want to ask you again. What is at stake here if I don't forgive? Go ahead. I'll pull up a chair and sit down. What's at stake if I don't forgive? You won't be forgiven. That's what's at stake. And you know why? You, 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 when you come to the Lord, you can't have any relationship at all with God if we're not forgiven. You know what God's got to do? He's got to lay aside our sins and trespasses. And so the, the, what's at stake here is that we won't be forgiven. The second thing, that I, that's number one, is what at stake. Number two the, that I want you to see is that we have a command to forgive. The picture here is a man walked to the Lord, or, or is coming to the Lord in prayer, and he's praying to him, and the Lord's going, whoa, do you have ought against your brother? Well, before we continue our conversation, I want you to go to him and forgive him, and then come back, then we'll talk. That's the picture. So number two is the command to forgive. Number three is the struggle 
with my flesh not wanting to forgive because I've been so hurt. So here's the illustration I use. We have God on this side saying, if you don't forgive me, I can't forgive you. And we have the flesh on the other side knowing that the command is there, but everything within our flesh is saying, I'm so hurt and afflicted that I can't go to that person and forgive them right now. So we have a gap. We have a gap. I want to say something, and some, this is probably going to disagree that, that's looking, or that watches later. I don't think you will. If you have a question, ask me. Lord on this side, me on this side, here's what I want to tell you and I want you to understand. And this, let me qualify it before you cast stones at me. If you're at the place where you are honestly assessed your heart and you say, I cannot forgive because I'm so hurt, here's what I want to say to you that you may not agree with. It's all right to be here as long as you have a desire to shut the gap and to get where God wants you to be. Okay? I feel that. It's all right to be there. Look, God told Abraham to go to Bethel. He stopped. He never, he went to, he, he, he stopped before he ever made it to where God told him to, but he made a altar between Bethel and, and, and I lost my wording, Ai, which was a place of sin in the house of the Lord. Before he ever got to where God told him to get, he stopped and he built an altar there. He knew where God wanted him to be. In other words, we know that God wants us to forget. But before Abraham could ever get there, he stopped and built an altar, and he camped at that altar. Listen, if you have to camp at the altar for a little while because everything within your flesh is just not ready to get to where God wants you to be, that's okay. Here's what I want you to know. It's not okay to be here if you have no desire to get over there. But it's all right to be here as long as... As long as my desire is to be what God wants me to be. Okay? God cannot work with our heart if there's no desire there. But if there's a desire there, that's something God can work with. And listen, forgiveness is not the only thing that you're going to find that God is asking of you that is more than what I can give at the moment. That's just too much. In fact, he is going to continually bring us to a place where we find that it is an impossibility to us. I said this to Pastor Brian earlier, but you know in the scripture when Jesus said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God, and our mind goes to auto automatically some supernatural healing or miracle. That's where our mind goes. Because we can't make a person get out of a wheelchair, but God can. But listen, this is an impossibility. I, I, I'll just preach to me because I've been here. This is an impossibility to me to go to a man that has afflicted me and my family and tell him I forgive you because if I do it, it's going to be in word only and I'm going to be a liar. So I'm looking at something that's impossible and what the Lord is saying, the thing that is impossible to you is possible with me. It's possible to me. And how was it possible that I placed my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary and then I get the help of the Holy Spirit to start changing and transforming that part of my heart that is locked up and does not want to conform to the will of God. I'm going to continually be here and I'm going to continually to find areas in my heart that is not yet been changed or transformed into the image of God. Listen, it's all right to be there as long as you have a desire to be where God wants you to be, to, to admit, to honestly assess yourself and say, God, I know what you're asking. I'm not there yet. But because that's what you want of me, I'm asking grace to flow on that part of my heart. I place my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And I'm just asking for you to help me. Look, that's right where God wants you. When, you. when you understand you can't, but God can, and now you're depending upon the help of God to, to, to help you and to transform that area of your heart that is a can't into a can, that's where God wants you. This is sanctification. We're just talking about a specific area, but this is sanctification. And so we honestly assess that part of our heart. The mental picture is I've got to close that gap. Now, we agreed that if I went to and just become a doer 
And I know James says not to be a hearer only, but a doer only, uh, a doer also. I understand that. And I'm not taking that out of context. But let me tell you this. If you just try to be a doer, if you just try to do and do and do and do, and it's not been changed in your heart, then that's all you're doing. That's all you're doing. The, the Lord is not... Ch- He's not wanting you to do just out of an action. He's wanting you to, to, to assess and say, God, I can't. It's not there yet. But if you'll change my heart and then do it out of a desire and not only out, out of an action only. Does that make sense? All right. We agreed that there are some afflictions that are so great that the gap is impossible for us to close on our own. We also looked at the major reason that a person does not forget and what is it let's think about that what is a major reason you don't forgive somebody that has afflicted you don't answer me out loud I'm just trying to get you to think I don't want you to answer out loud you know well because they're a sorry sorry individual okay I'm all by myself there what is a what is a main reason that you didn't forgive somebody One of the main reasons is this, because we don't feel like they deserve it. We don't feel like they deserve it. They're the one that done me wrong. I didn't do anything. So I don't feel like they deserve it. And so I lock myself up, and I'm now in a place where I'm not going to forgive them. And uh, even when the person doesn't deserve it, you know, uh, we've said this, you know what? If they really want my forgiveness, they can come to me. Y'all making me feel real good tonight. I'll say, I have said that. I've said, if they really want my forgiveness, then they can come to me. And if they, you know, I didn't do anything anyway, so I'll be fine. I'm going to just be blunt and plain, but I'll be fine if I don't talk to them no more. Yeah, a few others join me. There's some still got your halos on. You can take it off. I'm just speaking our mind. I'll be fine if they don't talk to me anymore. That's that's how we get. That's the position. That's the stronghold that begins to build up in our heart. Now that's the way we are, and we're going to look at what at what at what God wants. And and so you know we we all have our characteristic or personality. Well, I'm the way I am. That's just how I am, and I don't care to speak my mind. Look, that ain't something to be proud of. That's not something to be proud of. But it is the first step. If you recognize that's just the way you are, wonderful. And if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you need to let God change it. And so now here we are. We're at the place. I'm not going to give forgiveness because they don't deserve it. I'm not guilty. I'm 100% innocent. They have done it all. And I am not going to give forgiveness to them. And our example is this. Our forgiveness... Uh, this doesn't make you want to run to the altar. Well, you might want to check your salvation, but our forgiveness is supposed to be on the same basis of the reason that Jesus forgive us. And if you are the one that would say, I deserve the forgiveness of Christ, you'd be the first. Well, you wouldn't be honest because Romans says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And listen, if we think about it, most times in our situation, I'm not going to say all times, but most times in our situation when we have unforgiveness and we really feel like that they don't deserve it and that I'm innocent and they've done it all, a lot of times, I'm not going to say every time, but a lot of times if we really get to thinking about it, we're not 100% innocent. Oh, this is good. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus is 100% innocent. He didn't owe us anything. He didn't owe us nothing at all. And still yet, he gave his life so that we could be forgiven of our sins. That's the foundation. By what we receive forgiveness is how we should give forgiveness. Yeah. Give me a moment, I'll run to the altar and repent.
Okay, man, y'all making me feel real good. So we didn't deserve the forgiveness of Jesus, but he gave it out of love. Look at, she's going to bring it up, Matthew 18, so you, you, you don't have to turn there right now, but Matthew 18, I want you to look at this example, and I want you to think about what's going on here. The scripture is very simple in, in this text, but in Matthew 18, verse 21 through 33, listen to this. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not to you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. That doesn't mean 490. He's talking about unlimited, an unlimited time. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king. He's giving him an example right here, which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon, once uh, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he couldn't pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant, watch this, therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, will you have patience with me and I will pay you all. And the Lord, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, this is a type of Christ, and loosed him and forgave him of that debt. Now think about that. He didn't say, he didn't say right here, yeah, I'll have patience with you. I'll give you some time. He didn't do that. He just said, you know what? You've asked me. You have bowed down. You have humbled yourself. I'm not going to just give you some time. I'm going to forgive it. He just forgave it. So now you've got a servant who owed a debt that he could not pay, standing before his master who had the right to sell him his wife, his children, everything that they had, and get what money he could. And when the man humbled himself and moved down, you have the master moved on with, by compassion, and he said, you know what? I'm going to go further than what you even asked. I'm not going to just give you time, and I'm not going to just have patience. I, I feel that. I will forgive you of your debt. You owe me nothing. Now watch what the servant did. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Think about that. He's getting violent. He said, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. He went and cast him into prison so that he would pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that he was called, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave you of all that debt that you desire, because you desired it of me. Should not you also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I have had pity upon you? The servant was forgiven. He went out, seen somebody that owed him money, grabbed him by the throat and said, you'll pay me everything. That servant did exactly what he did, fell on his knees and said, will you have patience on me? And he said, no, and throwed him in prison. It's an example. The Lord here is, when he forgave the servant, is an example of what he does for us. But we are an example of what we do everybody else. That's what we do with everybody else. No, you owe me. Well, I mean, we owe, if we look at it that, we owe the Lord a debt we can't pay. And so he's saying, hey, I forgive you. Shouldn't you forgive the one that owed you? Okay, again, we still got the gap. I mean, we're, just because we're bringing out the text doesn't mean, look, closing the gap of forgiveness is, could be a process. It could be a daily deal of getting up and saying, God, I still have unforgiveness in my heart toward this situation, but I'm asking you to help me with it and believe in the Lord supernaturally to begin to change that. And so here's what he had, Christ as the example. Now, all right, I want to go further. It's going to really get quiet. I want to go a little further. I want you to see this. I, all, all, what I'm doing is I'm trying to, I'm trying to get us, the scripture ought to continually be a mirror for us. It shows us how holy and righteous that Christ is, and it shows us how, 
how unworthy that we are. And when we look at Christ and we look at how how, how far I am from the Lord, it should not, listen, it shouldn't discourage you. It should encourage you to say, Lord, I'm not there yet. So I'm asking you to help me. We'll never reach the place where we don't have things in our life that Jesus can help us with or needs to help us, things in our heart that needs to be changed. So, all right, everybody's still here. Nobody's run out yet. So let's go ahead and flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2, look at verses 5 through 10. And she's bringing it up. If you don't have your Bible, we need to look at it. He says this. Hey, you can get that. But if you have, if, if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me. I'm going to explain this. I know it sounds a little confusing, but I'm going to explain it. He has not grieved me but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Altars are open. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of of Christ. Here's the situation. If we went back to 1 Corinthians 5, I believe it is. There is a situation in the church. It's in the church where a man had uh, an adulterous affair with at least one, maybe more women. And because of this man's action, no, I mean, nobody's going to smile upon that. But because of this man's actions, the church, think about this, the church attacked him so much, they attacked him so much and kept on, instead of extending any type of grace at all, they kept on and kept on and kept on attacking him. And if we look at verse number seven, he said, perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with, uh, let's see, what is the wording? With overmuch sorrow, in other words, sink into a place of despair that even perhaps he might even contemplate taking his own life. This was happening because the church just kept on, kept on putting pressure upon him. They was not comforting. They was not helping him at all. They just kept on belittling him and casting him out. And you know what Paul says? Not only should you forgive him, but you ought to also confirm your love for him. Now, can I just be flat honest with you? This was my repentant moment for the week. He's still working on me. Because I can come to that step where I have allowed the Lord to develop forgiveness in my heart, but to go and to confirm my love for that individual, come on. So I'm back at, I thought, hey, the Lord's there, forgive her. You can't be forgiven, and I'm here saying, Lord, I'm not there yet. I place my faith in Jesus, and I'm asking grace to flow in my heart and in my life, and he's changing, he's changing my heart, and now we're having communication again, and the Lord's saying, you need to confirm your love for him. And I'm back over here and saying, Lord, I'm back where I started. There's, here's the gap. Because a person that is that low and thinking, contemplating, taking their own life because of the actions of the church. 
told you we'd be quiet. Altars are wide open. Now think about this. I'm going to go a little deeper, and I'm thinking I'm deep enough, but let me go a little deeper. The word confirm here in verse number 8, the literal meaning of it is to assure them and to pursue such a course of love for their soul that there's no room for the individual to ever doubt that you love them. <sighs> so uh, there goes the balloon just popped. There's no room for the individual to doubt that I love them. Have we forgiven, but we have left room? Well, I've forgiven, but that's between me and the Lord. And the Lord says, great, that's step number one. Step number two is you need to make sure that they know that you have forgiven them, that you love their soul so much. Yeah. Altars wide open. It means this. Pray for them. It means to reach out to them with love. Now, let me tell you this. It's not only okay, but it's necessary. When a person has afflicted or a person such as what they're talking about here that's committed an adulterous affair, it's not just okay, but it's necessary for the believer to tell them, I want you to know, I hate what you've done. Listen to what I'm saying. It's not just okay, it's necessary. I hate what you've done because it's contrary to the scripture. I don't like and I don't approve of any of your actions. Now we're feeling a little better, ain't we? I don't approve of any of your actions, none of them at all. I don't agree with them because they're contrary to the scripture. I will not approve of them. Right is still right and wrong is still wrong. But I want you to know I'm praying for you. I love you with the love of Christ. You can sit by me in church. If you go to the altar, I'll be right there next to you and put my arm around you. We have to be able, and we can only do it with the help of God, to, it's okay, love the individual, hate the sin, separate the action from their soul, and love them as a soul that's going to die and sink into despair and go to a devil's hell if somebody don't reach them. There are reasons that it may be so difficult for you to reach them because you may be the very one that could get to them. So the Lord says, now that you're forgiven, you need to confirm your love to them. Don't worry, I have altar time in just a little, in just a little bit. It means to pray for them because there's no room there is no room for them to doubt. Listen, there's no room for them to doubt that you love them. There's also no room for you, for them to doubt that you are 100% against their action. They don't need to doubt that. Because now, when they don't doubt that, they know that I'm not just reaching out in a fake way. I'm not reaching out and loving them just because of a natural reasons. I'm reaching out and loving them with the love of Christ because, look, I'm not whitewashing and I'm not overlooking what they've done. I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. So in order for them to have no doubt, they need to know where I stand 100% as a believer. And the place that I stand 100% is I can hate your action. I can hate your, your, the wrong. I will hate the sin. And I will make sure that you know that, but I will also make sure that you know that I love you as a, your soul and that I, I don't want anybody to die and go to devil's hell. My phone is open. If you need prayer and my uh, message, do whatever you want. I'll meet with you. I'll stop what I'm doing. I'll come where I'm at. I'll do whatever it takes to see that you are restored back to the Lord. But I will not bow down and okay your actions. Is that okay? Any questions?
Okay, and I'm fixing to address that, actually. Yeah. I know you didn't know that, so. Is there a question? Question. Well, uh, regard and the question is, how do they differentiate for those on live? How do they differentiate if I'm hating them or hating the sin? Well, long and short of it is this: is spiritual things cannot be discerned by natural man. So I'm not going to sit and try to make a natural man that. Let me, I'm going to use this example. It may not be popular, but somebody that claims they've been born homosexual. Uh, well, first of all, they need to be born again. Salvation is born again, but. Spiritual things cannot be discerned by natural man. So the way that I conclude that, uh, that conversation is this. I have a foundation that I live by. And what the Word of God says is right, I'm going to call it right. And what it says is wrong, I'm going to call it wrong. So I don't know what their foundation is, but according to what God gives us as a foundation, uh, that's my record and that's where I stand. And again, um, we're not here just to make them understand. We're here to give them truth. And let me tell you this. And some people say, well, it won't do no good. It won't do no good. The Bible says the word will not return void. In other words, I can tell somebody that is bound by homosexuality. I can tell them according to the word of God, the Bible says that is a sin. But I'm going to follow it up with this. I'm going to also say, but I want you to know the same grace that's changing my heart can change that desire in you also they can say what they want they can say you don't understand shut up whatever when I walk away the Holy Spirit is pricking their heart saying what he said was true what he said is true so it'll always do good question I had another question all right we must have answered it all right let me see. and we're talking about sister David's just brought it up about not trusting here's what I want to Look at the example of Joseph. Joseph's brothers and everything they'd done, throwed him in the pit. He went from there to the prison. He was lied on. He did not reveal himself to his brothers immediately because he didn't know if his brothers were right yet. Okay? Now, wait a minute. I want you to think about this. He didn't know if they were right, so he put them to the test. And that test was to see if they would bring back Benjamin that he, would never, met, that he never met, and he kept Simon there, and they did. And eventually he revealed himself. Now let me say it like this. Joseph didn't have the working and flowing of grace as we do, though we can look and see types of grace. He don't have the working of grace as we do because Jesus had not yet went to the cross of Calvary. So here's what I want you to understand and what I'm going to bring out as far as restoring relationships. As a believer, we have to be led by the Spirit. We have to be led by the Spirit. And we have to trust in the voice of God. It's going to make you pray. It's going to make you draw closer to the Lord. But we got to trust in the voice of God to, to tell us and to confirm to us if the relationship is right yet or if it's not right yet. And here's the thing. The question is a heart question I'm going to throw on you. It's a heart question. Are you being hesitant about, and you know, and sometimes relationships need to change. But are you being hesitant about any type of relationship because of fleshly reasons? Or are you doing it because the Holy Spirit is saying you need to wait? That's a hard question. If it's a fleshly reason, then we are already on the verge of being offended and building that wall around us. Because here's the thing about it. Brother Matt could be offended by somebody, and he can tell me, well, the, the, the Holy Spirit has not told me that it's okay to, 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 to pursue it anymore. i got to proceed with caution. Do you know, what, you know where I stand in that? Nowhere. 
That is between him and the Lord. I don't know if he's being led by the Spirit or being led by the flesh. That's between him and God. God, the Holy Spirit, New Covenant way, is God wants to talk to you. So whatever's going on there, that's between him and the Lord. I could do the same thing. Well, you know, the Lord has just not released me to, to, to this or whatever again. That's between you and the Lord. But here's something. As we allow the Lord to properly assess our heart and whether we're ready to forgive or not, and then if we're ready to confirm our love or not, we also got to let him assess our heart am I withholding because of fleshly reasons or am I doing it because the Holy Spirit said it's not right yet mature we're maturing we're growing in the Lord so the question is I have to am I being led by the Spirit the second thing is and we just got a couple of minutes did you have a quote something you want to say go ahead I asked Pastor Brian to take a mic because he has a lot of insight on this, and I, I had people asking if they could hear the comment. Go ahead. The, um, there's, there's always a fine line when you're talking about restoring relationships because you can still confirm your love to somebody, and that person still may be messing up. They, they still not, might not be, uh, you know, you know, if, if somebody has failed, you've restored them, whether it's somebody in the church or somebody outside or somebody in your family or whatever, you can still confirm your love to them even though things may not be all right between them and the Lord. You've not seen a complete change That's there. right. But one thing that you've got to be careful, especially when trust comes in, because you will not find in Scripture where it's okay to put anybody on probation. Because you right. can't put somebody on probation and say, well, you've got to do this, this, and this, and still turn around and completely confirm your love to them. And I said that to say this. That's a big thing for people. They want to put things on probation. Now, that's look, right. I understand. There is things that happen, and we can get as deep as what people want to go, and I don't think we really got to. But there is things that happen in, in families or whatever that relationships ain't going to be the same and you don't want them to be the same and uh and and things can ha things can drastically happen to the place that you can truly confirm your love to somebody and truly do that in your heart and show that to them although they're not eating supper with you tonight that's right and that's not putting probation again it goes back to where you have to be led by the spirit in what to do when to do and how to do exactly being led by the Spirit is the key there, uh, and 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 I, I want to make that clear because you can turn that back on. I just want to click it up, but um, being led by the Spirit is the key there, and and not being put on putting somebody on probation because of our own fleshly desires, our own fleshly ways, and so uh, let me let me make this statement, and then we're out of time again already. I'm I don't know. I may go back into it again, but we'll see. Um, I was asked this question. A person honestly felt like they forgive in their heart, but they're so hurt by the situation that they wondered if there's forgiveness, if they had forgiven. Well, again, that's a heart question for you. But we may be dealing with two separate scenarios. You may have honestly forgiven and the Lord developed forgiveness, but you may need a healing from your broken heart. And so they may, you may need to forgive if you forgive. It could be a trick from the enemy telling you you've not forgiven because, listen, who, why would the enemy of our soul not want to keep us on a place where, he, where we believe that we've not been able to forgive? Because he knows that if we can't forgive, that we can't be forgiven. And if he can keep you at that side of the scenario where you honestly feel like you have not forgiven and, you, and you've tried and you have no desire, you, you quit the desire, then we will get so discouraged and we will throw our hands and quit because I'm not able to forgive, so I can't be forgiven. Listen, don't let it be a trick of the enemy. Your first prayer is, Lord, I can't, but you can. I'm not there yet. But I believe because of what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary, that by and by the grace of God that I can have forgiveness in my heart in this situation. That's our first prayer. And then when you feel at peace at it, again, you have an individual relationship with God. 
I ain't going to tell you how long it'll take any of that. I don't know that. You have an individual relationship with the Lord, and you will know. If you're being led by the Spirit, you will know. And when you know that you have forgiven them and they're still hurt, you may have to go back and say, God, I'm, I need a healing from this brokenness in my heart. So it could be two different situations. It ain't the only mountain that we'll, uh, that we'll face, but if you're at this place where God is saying forgive and you're here and saying I can't forgive, you're all right. You're okay as long as you have a desire. And it's not even about a desire first to forgive. It's that you have a desire because forgiveness is just the subject we're talking about. There's going to be other subjects come up. It's not about you having the desire to forgive. It's about you having the desire to be what God wants you to be. Okay? And so if God's there saying, forgive or I can't forgive you, and you say, I'm not there yet, it may be, it may be with something else, love. It may be with something different. I don't know. But if God is saying you got to, you got to love or you can't go to heaven, love your brother, and you say, I'm not there yet, look, it's okay as long as you have a desire to get there. And again, the way we close the gap is that we look at what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary is greater in power. It's greater in power than the power that sets you back and built on forgiveness. And so if you're going to overcome something, you got to go to something greater, and the only thing greater is what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary. So when I place my faith there, the Holy Spirit starts working in my heart and changing and trading the unforgiveness for forgiveness. Listen, I know 100% that you can have un unforgiveness in your heart, and you can be mad, and I'll just be blunt and tell you this. You can have hatred. And you can have anger and everything in your heart. And then the Lord start changing that to the place where now you actually love them and you want to see them in a relationship with Christ. So that's what we want. Any questions? It's a big subject. Any questions? All right. Help me here. I want you to stand. I know we're five after eight and we try to quit at eight. But here's... My altar tonight is simply this. If you're at a place where you're saying, I'm not there yet, whether it's to forgive or to confirm your love, do they know they love you, that you love them? To confirm your love, if you say, you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely on that side. I can't do it yet. But you have a desire to be what God wants you to be. And that's where we're at tonight, is just to simply take just a moment and be honest with God and say, God, I'm not there yet. I've been hurt. I'm not belittling your situation. But you know what? God knows every detail about your situation. He knows how deep the cut is. He knows how big the wound is. But it's possible because of what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary. So tonight, I just want to take a moment while it's on our heart. You say, I'm not there yet, but I do want to be what God wants me to be. Let's start the process by finding ourselves a place to pray and just saying, Lord, help me close the gap. Help me to be what you need me to be. Help me tonight. Would you turn that up, please? Come on, let's find ourselves a place to pray. Now's the time. Can you turn it up a little more for me, please? Resting on your face, I know that there are angels hovering all around us for the presence of the Lord is in this place, and He.
single heart that is here. Lord, as we keep our faith in Christ and what you've done on the cross of Calvary, I ask that you touch Help us, God, to by the grace of God and the way you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, we ask you. Amen and amen. And we thank you so much for coming this evening and being with us tonight. I hope that it's been a help. We may continue with this kind of fill it out and see and, and uh, pray about it this week and, and go from there. But we hope that we're helping. We hope that uh, we, we encourage you and give you a little bit of something to, well, we, we give us all something to pray about. Amen. And so we say God bless you. Don't forget Sunday morning, be praying for that service, please. And uh, we hope that you come and, and just invite somebody to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you'll bow your head, Brother Greg, would you pray and dismiss